In this tutorial, we move into the remainder of Paul's argument concerning God's faithfulness and His promises to Israel. And so this brings us into chapter 9, verse 30, through 10, 21, and then into chapter 11. We're looking at the reason for Israel's rejection. And so let's jump in. Paul has already shown us the justice of Israel's rejection. He shows that physical descent doesn't guarantee one will inherit the promises of God. He shows that God is free in the exercise of His mercy and judgment. In essence, Paul says, first of all, God is God and He can do what He wants to. Of course, always consistent with His nature and character. But now he's going to show that God, in fact, had a reason to set Israel aside. Israel sought righteousness the wrong way. Look with me in chapter 9, verse 30. What shall we say then? that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. The Gentiles weren't looking for God's salvation. They, had, they, they were just out there living their lives apart from God, and they weren't even thinking about it. And yet they found God's righteousness by faith when the gospel message went to them. Verse 31, But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. And so Israel didn't get it, Paul says, because they were trying to get it by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Paul is quoting from Isaiah 8 and Isaiah 28. And in essence, he's showing that the Messiah would be a stumbling stone for some, but he would also be salvation for others. And those who trusted in him would not be disappointed. Their hopes, their expectations would be fulfilled when they trusted in him. And so Israel had sought righteousness the wrong way. They sought it by works instead of by faith. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. When Jesus came and He told the Jews that their self-righteousness was not good enough, they stumbled over that. They were offended by His message. But there were some who believed in Him as Messiah. And as Paul says, they were not disappointed. Well, in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, His heart's desire and His prayer to God for them, for Israel, is for their salvation. Paul says, I testify about them that they have a zeal for God but not in accordance with knowledge. They are zealous, but they are missing the point. Verse 3, not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so Paul's prayer is for Israel's salvation, but they're missing it because they're trying to gain righteousness by works when Christ is the final answer, in essence, is what Paul is saying. Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. They're zealous, but they're ignorant of God's righteousness that's provided through faith in Jesus. And so I want you to notice this, that Paul's desire in his prayer is for Israel's salvation. Now, this is bigger than personal individual salvation. Paul's desire is that Israel would have everything that God promised them. And if you've been following along in previous modules, you'll know that what God is pointing towards with the Jews ultimately is that Messiah would come and He would reign and Israel's golden age would begin, that their salvation would come. As Isaiah and Micah and other prophets spoke, they would have this period of great blessing where they would beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Paul longed for Israel to have her salvation. That would begin, first of all, with individual Israelites trusting in Jesus as Messiah. And that would be ultimately when God conquered the nations and brought Messiah to reign over all the earth. Well, in verses 5 and following, Paul shows that Israel was seeking to do something when the work had already been done. They were zealous but ignorant, and now uh, they're trying to, to work when the work had been done, verses 5 through 13. Now, notice this. The righteousness of the law speaks of what must be done. Verse 5, Moses writes 
that the man who practices the righteousness based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows, quote, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That if you confess Jesus with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. What Paul is saying here is that the, the righteousness of the law tells you you have to do something. But the righteousness based on faith tells you that you don't have to do because the work has already been done. Faith doesn't say, ascend into heaven and bring the Savior down. Faith believes He's already come. Faith doesn't say, descend into the abyss and raise Him up from the dead. Faith believes He's already resurrected. And so Paul says that the righteousness based on faith speaks of what has been done. And this righteousness based on faith is within reach of all. He goes on to say that in verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. This message that Israel needed was right there in front of them, but they ignored that message. All they needed to do was to confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised Him from the dead and they would be saved. In fact, God is rich in mercy on Jew and Gentile for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So in Paul's argument here, he's showing that Israel sought righteousness the wrong way. That's why God set them aside. They did not believe. Israel tried to do when the work had been done. As he said, being ignorant of the righteousness of God, they sought to establish their own righteousness. And then Paul goes on to say that Israel rejected her opportunity to be saved. Verses 14 through 21, it's a larger section that needs to be given more time. And I'm just going to give a quick summary to say here that Paul's basic argument is that Israel heard the message, but they refused to believe it. As he says in chapter 10, verse 21, All day long I have stretched out my hand to a disobedient and rebellious people. That's important because back in chapter 9, the question was raised, why does he still find fault? Who resists God's will? Paul was so emphasizing God's sovereignty in chapter 9 that someone can conclude that they're just helpless under God's sovereign hand. And Paul was emphasizing God's sovereignty that God has freedom to set Israel aside. But now he's showing, in fact, that he had a reason and that God is not to be blamed. If anyone is to be blamed, it's Israel because God stretched out His hand to a disobedient people. And we find that in the Gospels as well as the book of Acts. And so Israel was set aside because of her unbelief. Now I want to move on and I want to talk about the extent of Israel's rejection. We have the justice of Israel's rejection. God is God and we're not. We have the reason for Israel's rejection, unbelief and rebellion. And now we have the extent of Israel's rejection in chapter 11. Paul's going to show us, first of all, that the rejection of Israel is partial in number. Look with me in chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, God has not rejected His people, has He? May it never be, or God forbid. Paul says, here's the first proof. I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Someone can't conclude that God has rejected the Jews completely because Paul was a Jew and he had received God's mercy. And so you have Paul as proof, and then he goes on to speak about a believing remnant as proof. Verse 2, God has not rejected His people whom He foreknew. Or do you not know what the Scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. And I alone am left. And they are seeking to take my life. And so Elijah in his day, there was the apparent situation. Apparently he was the only one. Then there was the actual situation. Verse 4, what is the divine response to him? God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so apparently Elijah was the only one. But in reality, God had preserved a remnant. 
And Paul says, in the same way, there is a believing remnant even in Paul's day. Verse 5, in the same way, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And so just as it was in Elijah's day, so as it was in Paul's day, God had preserved himself a remnant. And he says in verse 6, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And so there was a remnant of believing Jews because of God's gracious choice. Verse 7, What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. And so God showed mercy, and yet God also hardened the rest in verses 7 through 11. He gives a quote here from uh, the Psalms and other passages as well. He says in Deuteronomy also, uh, he says here, just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and let them bend their backs forever. And so what you have here is that it looks like God has completely rejected Israel, but the rejection is partial in number. It wasn't complete. There was a remnant of believing Jews because of God's grace, but the rest of the Jews were hardened. And he quotes these passages to show that they have this spirit of stupor. They are blind. And as David says, their table became a snare. Those things that were intended to be for their blessing uh, became a snare to them. And this goes back to chapter 9 where they had all these blessings, the promises, the covenants, the glory, the fathers. These were their blessings, their table, but they came to be a snare when they trusted in them as their salvation. They trusted in their Jewishness as that which made them right with God instead of a privilege which gave them access to the knowledge of God through the Hebrew Scripture. And so Paul has shown then that the rejection of Israel is partial in number. It is partial because Paul is proof and the believing remnant is also proof. Now he's going to show the extent of Israel's rejection in that it is only temporary. It is temporal. It is not forever. He's going to go on to show that through Israel's fall, the gospel is going to the Gentiles. Look in verse 11. Paul says, I say then... They did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And this is a beautiful thing here because there's two different Greek words used, and one means to be tripped up, and one means to fall beyond recovery. And Paul, in essence, is saying, Israel didn't mess up so bad that there's no future. And his answer is, may it never be. But rather, by their transgression, salvation has gone to the Gentiles to make them jealous. And so when Israel rejected the gospel, it resulted in God turning to the Gentiles. Now, this is an amazing thing that shows up in the book of Acts. You see it in Acts 13, Acts 18, and Acts 28. In all three of those passages, Paul is speaking to Jews who, after their rejection of his message, Paul says, let it be known to you from now on, we go to the Gentiles. And Paul is showing that it's a, res it's a result of Israel's rejection of the gospel that is the platform and the transition by which the gospel goes to the Gentiles. The Jews rejected it, and it goes to the Gentiles. And so Paul says in verse 12, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? And so he talks about their fall resulting in the gospel coming to Gentiles. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of grammatical conversation here. And I want you to catch this. When Paul says there in verses 13 and 14, or excuse me, verses 12 and 13, just a rhetorical question, who is he referring to when he says, quote, there? He's talking about unbelieving Israelites. And he says their fall has resulted in the gospel coming to the Gentiles. Then he talks about their fulfillment. That language speaks of Paul's anticipation of a future restoration of Israel. He sees a future for them. 
And so Paul sees Israel's rejection of the gospel as riches for the world, the gospel coming to the Gentiles. He also sees a future for national Israel. Verse 15, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And so Paul speaks about their rejection being reconciliation for the world. It means that the message of reconciliation, the gospel, came to the world because in time, in history, the Jews rejected the gospel message and that became the occasion of the gospel coming to us Gentiles. Well, verses 17 and following, Paul continues his argument here. He shows that, uh, that, that there's a call for Gentile humility. Israel's fall equals the gospel to the Gentiles, but the Gentiles need to be humble and realize that they're coming into something by grace. Verse 17, he says, If some of the branches were broken off, and you who were a wild olive branch were grafted in among them, you became a partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, Paul says, don't be arrogant towards the branches. And in essence, what Paul is saying is, the Gentiles, they did accept the gospel. And the tendency might be to look down their nose in pride at the, Gent at the Jews and, and somehow believe that they're better than Jews because they accepted the gospel. Paul says that we Gentiles were like wild olive branches grafted in. We came into something that God was already doing in history. And so he says, don't be arrogant towards the branches. Remember this, he says, that it's not you that supports the root, but the root supports you. The way I take this language here in 17 and 18 is that as Gentiles, we were grafted in, probably speaking about the Abrahamic covenant and the promises of God that came there, that as Gentiles, we came into what God was already doing in salvation history. We were wild olive branches grafted in, and we became partakers with Israel of these promises that God gave to Abraham. We are blessed with Abraham, as we've already seen in Romans chapter 4. And so we shouldn't be proud towards Jewish people because we came into something that God was already doing in history. Verse 19, you will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. In other words, the Gentiles might say Israel was set aside so that us Gentiles could be brought in. And Paul says, well, you're right, partly. He says they were broken off for their unbelief. You see that again? That gets back to the reason why God set Israel aside. They were broken off because of their unbelief and because they rejected the gospel, God turned towards us. But that's something that God and His grace did, so we shouldn't look down our nose on Jewish people. In fact, Paul says, we should be humbled by God's grace coming to us. He goes on to say, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand, you Gentiles, by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. And here's why we should fear. If God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. And Paul, I believe, is talking at a bigger level than individual. If God set aside Jewish people because of their unbelief, and He turned towards the Gentiles... Paul is saying that if Gentiles don't keep responding in faith, God will turn away from them as well. I don't think he's talking individual. I think he's talking at a larger level. And then he says in verse 22, Behold the kindness and the severity of God to those who fell to the Jews. Severity. And in fact, this was severe. God's treatment towards the Jews was so severe that He set them aside and they have been set aside now for almost 2,000 years and counting. That's the severity of God. But He was kind towards us Gentiles. God's kindness if you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to craft them in. And so Paul is just giving a plea for humility. If God set aside the natural branches, we need to be humble and realize God can bring the natural branches back in. He simply set them aside for their unbelief. And now Paul turns to Israel's future salvation. Their future salvation. He says in chapter 11, verse 25, he says, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. 
When Paul uses this language, it means he's going to pull back the curtains and let us see into the plan of God. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When he says partial hardening, he's talking about partial in number. Not all Jews have been hardened. Paul is proof. The believing remnant is proof. It's also partial in duration. Notice that it's limited by time. He says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and then all Israel will be saved. And so Paul sees a future for Israel. They've been hardened temporarily, but not indefinitely. It's only until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And even now, in 2017, the gospel is going out to the Gentiles. But when God is ready, He will turn His attention back to the Jews and all Israel will be saved. And so the rejection of Israel is only temporary. All Israel will be saved, and we know that because it's written, because of the fathers, and because of God's desire to show mercy to all. Let's look at these as individual aspects. First of all, because it is written. Verse 26, all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And then he quotes from Jeremiah 31, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul sees a future fulfillment of Israel and the new covenant, future from his vantage point. And so Paul believed that Israel would find her salvation in the future when the deliverer comes. We're talking about the second advent. And so verse 28, he says, from the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. In other words, the Jews were enemies of the gospel. But from the standpoint of election or choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And so Paul goes back to the fact that God made promises to the patriarchs. And because of that, Israel can have confidence that their salvation will come in the future. All Israel will be saved because it is written and because of the fathers, he says. Verse 29, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. And God had called Israel to be his people and they will indeed once again be his people. He says in verse 30, just as you once were disobedient to God, and now you've been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience that he may show mercy to all. Now, this is a complex little statement here, so I want to make sure I, I elaborate on this. But Paul establishes a precedent. And the precedent is that Gentiles were disobedient, but they were shown mercy because of Israel's rejection, their rejection of the gospel. He says, just as you once were disobedient to God, talking about Gentiles, um, he says, just as you once were disobedient to God, and now you've been shown mercy because of their Jewish disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, Jews, that because of the mercy shown to you, they may also be shown mercy. God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. And this is a fairly confusing wording here, but basically what Paul is saying is that God has set a precedent that he shows mercy to disobedient ones. He showed mercy to Gentiles because of Israel's disobedience, but Gentiles were also disobedient. And since God showed mercy to disobedient Gentiles, that gives him grounds of showing mercy to disobedient Jews. He put all people, he shut up all people in disobedience so that he might show mercy to all. And this is what I call God's benevolent sovereignty. God in his amazing kindness and grace used Israel's rejection of the gospel as an occasion to take the gospel to the Gentiles. God used the Gentiles receiving the gospel as a precedent to show mercy to disobedient people. Therefore, he will show mercy to disobedient Israel. And God has done all this because of his desire to show mercy to all. And so that brings us then into verses 33 and following, where Paul says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, 
How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who became His counselor? Who is first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. And I like to call this an appropriate doxology. And what Paul is saying is, who would have ever thought of using Jewish rejection as Gentile inclusion? And who would have ever thought of using Gentiles being saved to make Jews jealous and then an occasion to show mercy to them? And so no one thought of this. No one gave this idea to God. No one was His counselor. But rather, this is the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And because of that, from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, this is the conclusion of this section, but I want to bring this back to where we started. The question was raised back in chapter 3, what advantage is there in being a Jew? Paul gave a brief answer and he moved on. In chapter 8, Paul said that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. The natural question for a Jew to ask is this, if God broke His promises with the Jews, how do I know that He won't break His promise with me? If something can separate Israel from the love of God, how do I know that I won't be separated from the love of God? And so uh, Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. God has forgotten me. And Isaiah said, or God said, a nursing mother might forget her children, but God would never forget Israel. In Isaiah 54, the mountains may shake and the hills may be removed, but God's loving kindness would not be taken from them. And then Jeremiah 31, God's covenant. Israel would not cease from being a nation before Him. So the climactic answer of Romans 9 through 11, it is not as though the Word of God has failed. And to bring it back home to the believers in Rome, the answer is this, is that God will not let go of Israel, and therefore God will not let go of me. God has not broken His promises to Israel. They have not been separated from the love of God, nor will I ever be separated from the love of God. And so that's why I said this was a very appropriate thing for Paul to deal with on the heels of making this promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God. 